33 minutes after the hour now. This is Catholic Drive Time. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, Adrian Fonseca is taking a couple of uh, very well, well-deserved well uh, days off. And uh, my name is Dave Palmer, filling in for him uh, from the DFW studio of the Guadalupe Radio Network. And just a reminder also, this is the first day of uh, officially of the car raffle season, okay? And um, and we want to uh, encourage you to tune in at the end of this program. This program ends at uh, 7.30 Central Time, and then we have the after show for about 30 minutes. And when we go on the air at 8 o'clock Central Time, I'll be hosting, and we're going to have a number of other folks uh, from across the Guadalupe Radio Network joining me as well. And there's a theme this year called Pay It Forward, okay? And you're probably familiar with that term, Paying It Forward, where we're going to encourage you to not only buy a raffle ticket for yourself for a chance to win a 2024 uh, GLB Mercedes-Benz 250 uh, in night black, but also to buy one for somebody else, okay? So a lot more detail on that coming up at the top of the 8 o'clock hour. We'll have a whole hour explaining all this. And I'll be joined on the air with a whole lot of people. But I just want to give you a little preview. And so, please, if you can tune in for that, uh, we'd really appreciate that as well. And so, uh, and also, as I mentioned also, uh, you may have heard a few hints now here and there that Adrian and and Rudy have thrown in about some changes going on with the morning show. And three weeks from today, there is going to be a change. And it's going to be very exciting. And uh, there's been a lot of preparation put into this. Uh, Adrian's still going to be the host. He's not going anywhere. Rudy is still going to be involved. I'm going to be involved in a, in a small way and some other folks as well. Uh, Debbie Giorgiani, Adam Bly. And so anyway, so, so just kind of stay tuned for that. I don't want to give a whole lot of details out. But uh, when Adrian gets back on Thursday, I think he will start to revealing a lot more information as we move closer to that date. All right. So, uh, all right, it is 35 minutes uh, after the hour, and I believe we have our uh, guest on the phone with me. Father Jeff Kirby, are you there? Yes, sir. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. How are you? Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank, thanks so much. I uh, I was at um, McDonald's yesterday morning uh, trying to keep my, my 10-year-old son entertained, and I was listening to an interview that uh, you did about your book, and I just found it absolutely fascinating as a little bit of preparation for my interview with you. And so I'm very excited to learn more about the inspiration behind this book and uh, why you wrote it. And so let me just give Father uh, Jeffrey Kirby a, a formal interview. The, the name of the book that we're going to be talking about Uh, during the next 20 minutes or so is called uh, year with the Pope's daily meditations from the vicar of Christ. It's published by tan books and father Jeff Kirby is a papal missionary of mercy. He is the pastor of our lady of grace parish in Indian land, South Carolina, and also an adjunct professor of theology at Belmont Abbey college. Uh, He is a senior contributor to the crux news site he is host of a daily devotional called The Morning Offering with Father Kirby and host of the podcast Truth Be Told and the author of several books on spiritual, moral, and pastoral subjects. Uh, Father Kirby, am I okay so far? Did I get all that right? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're knocking it out. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm always afraid because I, I didn't confirm that uh, bio with you, but I've so many times I've, I've given people those bios out and they come back and said, actually, you know, I did this, did that. So anyways, we're off to a good start. All right. So. So, uh, Father, um, tell me a little bit about the inspiration behind uh, Year with the Pope's Daily Meditations from the Vicar of Christ, because it seems like a pretty vast project to tackle. And maybe you can just kind of give our, our listeners an idea of what exactly is this devotional book. Yes, yes. So a few years ago, I, I approached uh, Tam Books, uh, the publisher, and they have a series. So a year with, you know, and so year with the Bible, year with the mystics, year with you know, so on. So it's a it's a, a series that they have of, of different uh, books, and I propose that we do a year with John Paul II um, because I just thought that you know there's so much in his teachings that you know really still need to be kind of taught and and, and you know brought to the attention of the faithful and, and and so on. And and in the discussions with the publisher, they said, well, how about we we broaden it and make it a year with the popes. And uh, so we went back and forth with some conversation and brainstorming on some ideas, and, and I thought, yeah, that, that actually makes a lot more sense. And so so that's kind of where the idea of a year with all the popes, we've had 366 of them, excuse me, 266 of them. And so, um, okay, so, okay this, is, this, is, this is the new plan. And, and immediately 
when that was the, the new perspective, I thought, well, I really want to take advantage of this and, and, and make it a spiritual experience, but also a catechetical one, an apologetic one, a historical one, to really just show the beauty of all the different men who have been called uh, that beautiful sacred tradition of, of the sacred uh, office of, of St. Peter. And so started with a whole part on St. Peter. I went all the way back to the prophet Isaiah <laughs> to show the prophecies of the key bearer in the kingdom of David and that being fulfilled by the Lord. And, and just wanted to show Catholics through a spiritual experience every day that this is an office that is very much a part of the fulfillment of promise, promises and promises and prophecies by the Lord Jesus. This is something that's just at the, at the bedrock and the heart of our faith as, as Catholic Christians. And so did that and went through the prophecies and then uh, the Gospels and the relationship between St. Peter and the Lord and, and, and the lessons behind the different encounters that Peter had with the Lord and Acts of the Apostles highlight some really powerful stories that really somehow just have not trickled down to the faithful. And then the two letters of St. Peter in the New Testament. And then from there, really just bounced <laughs> all through church history. And then give a nice chunk to Vatican II and then our beloved John Paul II. And then concluded with Benedict and Francis. So um, <laughs> it was a labor of love. Yeah, I can only imagine when the the folks at Tan Book said, uh, let's not just focus on the, what, uh, 25 or 26 years of uh, Pope St. John Paul II, but the entire history of the church, you must have uh, thought, oh my, <laughs> oh my, this is uh, this is really going to take a whole lot more research, isn't it? We got about, Father Kirby, we have about two minutes before we, we take our break, but uh, how how do you possibly do that? How do you look at, uh, t- you know, 2,000 years of church history and say, I'm going to, I'm going to pick this and this and this got about a minute or so but uh, what was your strategy other than what you've already said about scripture and saint peter yeah so luckily i had uh, my bachelor's degree at franciscan university was in history so i had a, a a large background to draw from basically was what are the highlight events in church history what are some you know powerful and rich spiritual teachings who are some of the men the mystics who have been popes that really haven't been talked about so just trying to highlight things that could help us each of us in our own discipleship. What are the things that could encourage us or call us on the greater holiness? Those were some of the tenets I used in terms of what was selected and what was not. Yeah, and one thing I said before in before introducing you is that even though it's January 2nd, this is a devotional, but it doesn't matter that we're already in January 2nd. This can be started anytime and picked up anytime. It does have 365 entries, though, right? It does, it does, exactly. But right, to your point, it's not January 1st, January 2nd. No, it's just day one, day two, day three. It can be started anytime. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know that that can be a real uh, frustrating thing because I know I've tried to do the, the the daily Bible and you you get five or six days behind <laughs> right. and all of a sudden you're you're kicking yourself or you're you know staying up for three hours trying to catch up and before long it's more of a temptation to uh, sin and frustration uh, than than anything. But I know I've heard you say that. Hey, don't put a lot of pressure on yourself to try to do one a day. Sometimes you might do two a day and then skip a day and just uh, uh, God God will take care of it. Uh, the, the Father Jeff Kirby is my guest. He is the author of the uh, Year with the Pope's Daily Meditations from the Vicar of Christ. It's published by Tan Books, and he joins me via phone to talk about this. And Father, I you talked about the the vast scope of I think you said 264 popes over you know thousands of years, and just the how, how challenging it must have been to kind of narrow down what you're going to talk about for the 365 devotions. Can can you talk about some of the periods of the church? I know you talk about maybe one of the low points being the the Renaissance period where we had some popes that weren't of high character. Maybe some highs and lows through the history of the church as far as the papacy. Yeah, so first I'm going to be the powerful ones and, and, and spiritually edifying ones that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of Catholics aren't aware of how many spiritual masters and mystics have been popes. Uh, think of Pope Pius VII, who, you know, when the church was just being beaten up by the Enlightenment, um, you know, God raises up this pope who, who's really like a Padre Pio. He could levitate, had the power of healing, could read hearts, uh, a powerful man, uh, a great mystic at, at a really pivotal time in the life of the church. Uh, also, we think more recently in terms of Pope Leo XIII, that, you know, a time when 
the whole papal states, which was a small country that used to be ruled by the Pope, was just overtaken by revolutionaries, and the Pope become prisoners of the Vatican. And, and while this is happening, God raises up this powerful teacher, especially on the rosary. No one has taught more about the rosary than Pope Leo XIII. And, and that might surprise people, because they think, oh, I thought it was John Paul II. But actually, Pope Leo beats him, uh, had just this great love for Our Lady, and just constantly called the Church to the mantle of Our Lady. And so these are just powerful examples, and, and there's so many. The vast majority of the popes have been really holy men that have really loved the Lord Jesus and have tried to lead the faithful to a greater relationship with, with Jesus Christ. So, so that's what I definitely want to focus on, you know, preeminently. But then I'd say we've had about uh, maybe less than 10 bad popes. Now, think about that. You have over 260 good ones, right? You know, and, um, and, and I should say of, of the 266, you know, you think of that number, uh, only less than 10 have been really bad, you know. And when I say bad, um, what I mean by that is that a lot of times they lived uh, really horrible lives. Um, you know, had mistresses and illegitimate children, poisoned people, killed people, engaged in needless wars, um, and, and, and just... Again, just really not very serious in terms of their own discipleship or their own call to holiness. What's interesting about these bad popes is, and I say bad and lukewarm, because there were some popes who maybe they weren't as morally uh, corrupted, but were just weak, uh, just did nothing at, at pivotal times in the church when you know strong leadership could have really helped you know, the, the the call to holiness could have helped the spiritual health of the church. And, and so bad or, or, or lukewarm. And, and yet during these times when we have these bad or lukewarm popes, that's when the church received some of her most powerful saints. So it's almost as if the Holy Spirit was saying, okay, well, if, you know, imagine Lord Jesus saying, like, if my vicar's not going to do it and the shepherds aren't going to be the holy ones, then I'll raise up from the grassroots holy ones. And so, uh, you know, St. Paul says that we make up what is lacking in the body of Christ. And so in these moments of bad popes, God bless us with powerful clusters of saints uh, at these moments. And, and I think that's particularly insightful. And also, these bad and lukewarm popes, like, they were too busy in their own moral corruption that they never attempted to, you know, uh, defile or change or adulterate uh, teachings. So, so doctrine was, was held intact. So even the bad popes couldn't uh, corrupt uh, this, uh, this body of teachings given to us by Jesus Christ. Is it true, Father, that perhaps the worst pope of all time gave us the, uh, the Angelus prayer? And, and how uh, amazing, first of all, is that, is that true? And maybe give us a little bit of background. And it shows that good can even come out of uh, bad situations. Yeah, yeah. so Alexander VI, who was a Borgia pope, Sometimes people think he was a Medici, but he was actually a Borgia. And Borgia is, is Spanish, it means bull. And the family came from Spain, and so when they were elected to the papacy, when Alexander was elected to the papacy, first of all, he took his name after Alexander the Great, not Pope Alexander V. <laughs> that, that tells us something. And, and when he <laughs> went to, to Rome, he very much felt like he had an axe to grind because he was the outsider, he was a Spaniard. Uh, in in Rome, and because of that, uh, his moral defilement just reached levels that um, very few could rival with. And and yet, this man who is completely morally corrupt, um, scandalous in in his way of life, was the one who <laughs> wrote the Angelus Prayer, which many Catholics are aware of. We it's traditionally prayed three times a day, and he also gave us what's called the line of demarcation in the New World, which means he prevented a really, what could have been a world war, a very serious war between Spain and Portugal in their uh, colonies in the New World. So here's this man who <laughs> himself morally corrupt, yet becomes, through the grace of God, this great peacemaker and, and shows this spiritual awareness to write the Angelus Prayer. So I always point out that, you know, we see this in the Gospels with, you know, with corrupt leadership that, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to work with or in spite of leadership. And in the case of Alexander VI, the Holy Spirit continued to work in spite of his, his moral corruption. 
Could you talk a little bit about the intersection between world events and particular crises that were going on? I'm thinking of something like slavery or the the, the sexual revolution back in the 60s, of course, which <laughs> continues. We feel the, the effects of that today and how the, the popes got involved in that, how they wrote about it or perhaps even changed uh, the culture because of their influence. I think uh, uh, Pope St. John Paul the Great and his work in Poland to bring down communism, to help bring down communism. Uh, Talk about maybe some of the highlights that come out in your book on on those kind of issues. Yes, very much. I wanted to to highlight essential moments like that, especially in situations where the voice of the church or the teachings of the church have not been highlighted or, or really told, especially among Catholic Christians. And so sometimes we're left with the idea that these major events happened and the church had nothing to say. <laughs> when, when actually, if you look, the, the popes actually were, were teaching pretty strongly. So, for example, the slave trade. The popes were constantly denouncing the slave trade and, and quite vehemently at one point giving this, you know, this, this kind of like broad decree of excommunication to any Christian who assisted in the selling of a human being and, and powerful uh, ex, you know, assertions of, of human dignity. Also, the Galileo affair. So, what was what did the church actually say? What really were the problems there? And, and clarifying that, clarifying the real nature of the Crusades. Like, what was going on there? What what really was the Pope hoping to accomplish? Because uh, we know there were some abuses during the Crusades. But what really was the Pope's intention? And then things like the Black Death. Uh, with the recent COVID pandemic, that definitely resonates and hits home. What was the Pope saying? What was happening during the Black Death when millions and millions of people were dying throughout Europe? And, and, and again, just highlighting these major events in you know, the history of Western civilization, which is also the history of the Church, and just allowing the Popes, their voice to be heard, in some cases for the first time. Uh, let, let me give you an example. There was a, a famous naval battle in the late 1500s, uh, right off of the coast of Greece, a place called the Ponto. The Battle of the Ponto is very important because Christian forces went against Muslim forces. Christian forces were greatly outnumbered. If the battle had been lost by the Christians, the faith would have been lost in Europe. You know, and so very, very serious. And Pope St. Pius V, another amazing mystic and spiritual master, calls the entire world to pray the rosary. Now, this is a few decades after the Reformation, so it calls the entire world, every Christian, to pray the rosary. And everyone begins to pray the rosary, and the Christian forces, greatly outnumbered, uh, are victorious. And I wanted to find that actual decree of the Pope calling all Christians to pray the rosary. Well, I'll tell you, it, it was quite a feat. I was shocked. I thought, you would think this would be available. That was one of the hardest documents it took me to find and then to find it in English. Really? So, and I thought this would be something you would think that would be really out there. I mean, this is a, a powerful call to all of Christendom, Catholic and Protestant, to turn to Our Lady, to preserve the faith, to keep the gospel safe in Europe. And, and, and just things like that where I, I thought these are amazing moments, pivotal moments that we need to know about and we need to hear from our spiritual fathers. What were they saying during these situations, these events. Uh, Father Jeff Kirby is the my guest. And, uh, Father, we're down to a couple of minutes, and that music's going to start here at the top of the hour, and I don't want to get us cut off, so I want to make sure I, I throw in the name of the book uh, again, and uh, perhaps you can tell people where they can find it other than the normal, probably at Catholic bookstores. That's always my first recommendation. Year with the Pope's Daily Meditations from the Vicar of Christ, uh, published by 10 Books, Father Jeff Kirby. And, Father, if you can uh, maybe tell people where it's found, and also if if you have, while time allows, tell us the connection between this book and also your relationship with your father. I heard you explain that story in another interview, and I think that's uh, obviously very significant to you personally. Would you? Can you share that with us? Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, we, we started the project, and um, you know, my father was in, was in uh, very bad health uh, for about six years, and we started the project while my dad was still alive, and then his health. Um, really dropped uh, significantly while I was working on the book. And uh, during that work, uh, that, 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 that time, uh, my father passed away. And in the book, I, I am highlighting constantly the spiritual fatherhood, uh, the spiritual masters, um, 
the the mystical role in the life of the of the popes and 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 especially again that first part that you know spiritual fatherhood and so as I was working on this when my father died I thought I I can't I can't keep doing this this is um, grieving my father while writing about spiritual fatherhood I it just this is becoming um, too much and I actually turned to the publishers and said you know uh, I'm so grateful for the opportunity but I think you need to find someone else to to finish this. Um, and they came back and said, no, um, <laughs> we, you take whatever time you need. This is a couple of years from now. We don't care. Uh, we really like what you're doing. And we want you to finish this. And I thought, okay, all right, great. And believe it or not, I approached him a second time and said, you know, I just feel really bad. This project is just sitting. Nothing's getting done. Um, I don't know when I'm going to be back in, a, in an emotional place, a, a spiritual place to do this. And I said, look, Father, you take whatever time you need. Um, you know, this is later, years from now, we don't care like this. We really want you to do this. And, and I'm glad they did that because um, it gave me the, the space, the time, and but also the opportunity to eventually get back to the work. And this work actually became a help in, in that grieving process. Um, uh, Father, father th- th- thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, father Jeff Kirby, um, I'm glad we got that in, the, that in there. You're-